All right. Welcome to week four. It's my honor to serve you in the Word this morning. Um, if you have your Bibles or Bible apps, and I hope that you do, um, uh, we're going to start in James 1. We've been um, in a series that kind of tethered to this particular scripture. And um, I want to start there, root there, and then uh, we're just going to see where things go. Um, because I have six pages of notes, and we don't have six pages of time. So we're just going to have some fun. All right, y'all good? Y'all good? So uh, let's, um, let's, get into, uh, let's get into his word. Let's see what Holy Spirit has for us this morning. Um, I think it's something profound. I think, um, and I, I'm, I'm at the spot where I think, but I actually get in place, co- close to a place where I know that should we refuse to develop a personal culture that is inhospitable to offense. We will not enter the full destiny purposes on our lives. You can come out of sin, you can come out of bondage, simply by crying out to Jesus. The nation of Israel, 400 years in slavery, and it says, they cried out to the Lord, and the Lord heard their cry. And he sent a deliverer in Moses. And one of the things that we learn is that a shepherd can take you out of bondage and slavery, but it will take a warrior to take you into the kingdom. Joshua was not a shepherd. He was a warrior. And so that shows us that I need to be shepherded. My heart needs to be shepherded by God out of sin and into freedom. But there's a place in the life of every believer when you come, when you initially come out of darkness and into his marvelous light, and you can either remain with the worldly mindsets that kept you in that place, even though he's taken you out. But without abandoning abandoning those mindsets, we don't actually get into the promised land that he's called to us. Someone say, he promised me. It's a fascinating thing because sometimes we think that the promises of God will come regardless of what I do, say, or think. Because they're his promises. They're yes and amen. Yes, that's true. But everything, someone say everything. Everything in the kingdom of heaven is afforded and granted by his grace through my faith. I've got to move. I've got to steward my heart. I've got to actually declare life out in front of me so that I can actually walk into the places he's ultimately called me to. Or I can spend 40 years in a desert. I can spend the rest of my life in a desert. And yes, my shoes won't wear out. I'll have food on the ground when I wake up every single morning. I will be blessed of God, but I will never see the fullness of his destiny purpose on my life unless I get past certain things, and one of them is offense. James chapter 1, verse 2 says, My brethren and my sistren. Sorry, I, I, I just like to include that. I don't think sistren is actually a word, but it should be. Count it or consider it all joy. Someone say joy. Joy. Thank you, Mr. Buckley. I appreciate you. No, I really appreciate that. That wasn't just the sound of your soul. That was the sound of your spirit. Thank you. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing, someone say, because I know. See, we have joy because we know something. It says, for the joy set before him. It wasn't joyful going to the cross. It was the joy set before him. He knew something, family. He knew something on the other side of the cross that said, you all think you've got the upper hand now. But you have no idea the reality I'm about to split open on the earth once I come through this thing. Someone say, I'm coming through this morning. Consider it all joy when you fall into various trials. (laughs) 
knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Some of your translations might say endurance right there. And let endurance have its perfect work or result, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. See, the kingdom of heaven is analogous to the promised land in in ancient Israel in that um, we're to enter a place in, in life where we lack nothing. Oh, yeah, I, Sean, we're just a bunch of imperfect people. I know, I get it, but you know what? When I, I've got to wrangle that concept against when Jesus said, therefore, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Red letters. Red letters, wrangle it out. It's difficult to disagree with Jesus. He kind of runs the show. Like, someday we'll be staring him in the face. There's like, there's no, there's no excuse. There, there's, no, there's, no, there's no argument in heaven. Did you know that? Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There's no other will except for God's always being done in heaven. He's always right. Consider it all joy. What does it mean? Does it mean, I, does it mean it's, I'm supposed to be happy when trials are happening? No, that's not what that's saying. It's saying consider it all joy knowing. Because you know something. Every time you're tested, every time you're in trial, every time, you, uh, every time an offense comes your way. And by the way, Jesus said offenses would come. He didn't say there wouldn't be a time in your life when offenses would just stop coming. No, seriously. Sometimes, uh, church, sometimes I feel like we got to get a little sober and stop believing some, some dream world reality that says someday I'll just, I'll be retired and I'll get to do this and I'll get to go here and just everything will be roses and I'll never have a problem the rest of my life. No, it, that's not how he set it up. He chose to take everything, someone say everything. He chose to take, no, say everything, please, please, please. My, 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 my prophet um, encouraged me not to yell at you quite so much about like your responses, so I'm just inviting you. Please say everything. There isn't a spot that we get to in life where we're just done going through stuff. That word said everything that the enemy meant for my destruction. He turns it for our good. But he doesn't turn it for my good unless I partner with his good. He doesn't? No. Because every single thing that he invites us into, I have to take some kind of movement. I have to take some kind of step that believes him regardless of the circumstance that I'm in right now. So I consider it all joy, knowing that the testing of my faith. When does joy come? When I recognize... (laughs) And here's where emotions get loud. How many of you have loud emotions? This is where emotions get loud, okay? So something happens, blank hits the fan, and boom, I've got blank all over me. And now in that moment, I can either sit down in my muck, I can either sit down in the crap of life, I can sit down in my offense, I can sit down in my pain and say, woe is me. Now, please hear me, and I'm going to say this again at the end just to make sure that no one's mishearing me. I'm not saying you can't process pain. Please don't hear me say that. But there's a difference between processing pain and wallowing in it. And his goodness, his mercy, it beckons me forward. It calls me on. He's like, I know, I know. And you can either stay right there in the knowledge that they really crapped all over you, or we can clean you up and I can show you how to do this going forward. I consider it all joy knowing that the testing, the crap, the muck, the junk, the consequences, the circumstances, that it's all for my good. That it's all moving something in me so that at some point, it doesn't mean the circumstances of life become roses. It, become, it means that what becomes internal inside of me is all roses. The most offended person in the Bible and in history is Satan. 
When we choose to remain in offense, misery loves company, and this is company that you don't want to have over for Thanksgiving dinner. Conversely, the person with the most reason to live in offense in the Bible and in history is Jesus. And when we choose to issue forgiveness to those who have treated us better, should have known better, should have known who we are, we're in good company. You know how um, I hear a lot of preachers all, all over often say, we're never more like Jesus than when. And I don't think we get that right. Usually what comes next, I don't think we get right. I'm going to try one this morning. And it may or may not be right, but it feels good to say. I don't think we're ever more like Jesus than when being reviled, we choose not to revile. When being offended, we choose not to become offensive. When, when being utterly trashed on, we choose not to lash back. I don't think we're any more like Jesus in those, than in those moments. Because I think almost anything else, I think we can learn to move by faith. We can learn to, we can learn to pray for people's healing. We can, we, can, we can endure all kinds of things. But, but when we're being wronged, and we shouldn't be, I think we get offended largely when we take our eyes off the cross. Do you guys know the, um, let me, let me, let's do a little, little teaching lesson for a second. The word offense in the Bible, specifically in the Gospels, is where, is the word where we get the word scandal. It's like scandalizo, scandalizo, something right around. And the word actually means to bait or to set a trap. And so when the enemy puts offenses in our path through other people, let's just be honest, it's not like, it's not like the enemy is setting like wood, wood traps in a forest the way a hunter would, right? Okay, so, but, but he'll set it by words. And he sets it by things like assumption. Someone say assumption. Assumption is one of the traps within the trap. Because it means that when you harm me, when you say something wrong to me, when you hurt me, what happens is the enemy's like, yep, I knew they were going to do that. And starts to feed our thoughts with assumptions of their motives. They did this because this. They did this because this. They did this because they're jealous. They did this. And all of a sudden, now we're doubly trapped. And here's what happens. Let's imagine for a second that I've got, um, and I actually felt this prophetically um, in, even, even in, in prayer this morning. I felt uh, two shackles on people. And no matter how, mu how much I actually danced it out during prayer, um, I actually still felt these shackles. And so I think it's a prophetic picture of what's happening. I want you to imagine for a second that um, I'm walking along and I kind of get, get snared and I get trapped. In, 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 in an offense, okay, but we'll call it an offense, but let's just say, yes, they're in a trap. Now, person A comes along, and they see that you're snared, you're trapped, you're offended, you, you've, you, you, you've, you've clearly got something that is keeping you from moving forward. Did you know that all of this is to keep you from moving forward? Did you know that everything about offense is meant to keep you from moving forward? The enemy does not want you to get to your Jordan River. He does not want you to cross through. He does not want to get you to the promised land because in the promised land, you win every battle that you go in with the Lord. You take land. You cultivate land. You, have, you absolutely reshape earth's cultures to look like heaven. He doesn't want you anywhere close to that. So he snatches you. He snares you. It says in Proverbs 29, 25, that the fear of man is a snare. It comes with a snare. All right, so imagine for a second. So I, I get snared. Now, here's what happens. Somebody can come along and say, Sean, I see you're trapped. Sean, I see you're ensnared. You, you're, 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 you're hurting. I mean, like I can see you're bleeding. I mean, you, 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 can I get this off you? And here's what we do. Can you believe what they did to me? Can you believe this? And, like, and they're working around. They're working around. Trying, no, yeah, let me help you get off. No, can you believe? Can, look at me. Look at me. Can you believe that somebody did this to me? And this is what we do. This is the culture of offense. The culture of offense is one in which we, um, we coddle this thing that, ha that is injuring us. We coddle this thing that is toxifying our lives. It says in Ephesians, be angry, but do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Did you know that anger has a shelf life of one day before it spoils into offense? Jesus said offenses will come. How many of you know, t tomorrow, sometime this week, you might get angry. 
You got the rest of that day to work it out before something begins to fester the next day. One day. And so you got this thing, and what we do is we try to convince the person who's trying to help us how much that person hurt us by laying the snare, by laying this trap. And so we keep them. I know, I look like I'm boxing out in basketball, don't I, Joel? But we keep them at bay from actually being able to free us so that I can actually move forward. And meanwhile, the one thing I need to hear is the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the good news to the poor, to the ones who are in pain, to the ones who are in bondage, to the ones who are in prison, to the ones who have been snared. This person's coming along, and and we're we're not letting them in. If we haven't figured out the person is Jesus, coming through the voice of anyone around us that's actually, it says, um, I, th- I think it's also in Ephesians, it says, um, when a brother or a sister is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. We are our brother's keeper. We are our sister's keeper. We're actually called to kind of figure out, like, like Lisa and my wife are all about this. I'm, I'm not as good at this, but they're like, the eyes don't lie. Like, they can, they can always tell when, like, when, when somebody's just, like, in a murky internal spot just by looking in people's eyes. So sometimes I'm like, <laughs> hey, you, you walk into work and you're like, you don't, you don't want Lisa, you don't want Lisa and Alden like looking in your eyes and be like, it's all good, it's all good, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. Because we're to learn to know one another after the Spirit and not after the flesh. All right, we're talking countercultural this morning, so I do want to, um, uh, I want to hit a couple practicals. Um, before we close up, and just so you know, if you're staying around for the 11 o'clock, I'm, I'm likely to go a multitude of other places, okay? So I um, hope you guys are doing okay this morning. So what's the good news? Because I'm majoring a lot on offense, and, and, and I get it. I, th- I just think there's a lot to say about it. Um, but here's, here's two things that, um, that we want to grab with regards to the good news. How many of you know the gospel is good news? Hallelujah, Jesus. We should get some good news before we leave this morning. Um, number one, it is in our power to cultivate a heart condition that creates an inhospitable environment for offense to take root. That's good news. I'll say it again. It is in our power to cultivate a heart condition that creates an inhospitable environment for offense to take root. Um, if you want more on this, um, several months ago I preached a message called... Uh, um, creating unoffendable culture. <laughs> um, and the, um, one of the things I talked about was um, the parable of the sower and the seed. If you remember, okay, so there's four types of soil, etc. It also works on the flip side. So if I've actually created a heart condition that, that actually brings in offense and, and cultivates it, then I, like, I need to do some work to now cultivate a different type of heart soil. Does that make sense? Okay, and it's in my power. Someone say it's in my power. It's in my power to do that. Okay. The other part of the good news, number two, is this. This hurdle offense is, uh, sorry, I should say, this hurdle of creating an unoffendable culture for you. Okay, countercultural. This hurdle is likely your last obstacle to living fully free and heaven's purposes fully actualized in your life. I'm going to say that again. This hurdle of creating a personal, unoffendable culture is likely your last obstacle to living fully free and heaven's purposes fully actualized in your life. How do I know this? Nation of Israel, it says the number one reason that the nation of Israel did not go into the promised land is because they were complaining and grumbling. They were offended with God. They were offended with Moses. They were offended with his leadership. They were offended. They were, they, their offenses had offense. Their offenses grew offense. And, 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 and it all came down to this. Guys, are you ready for this? This is, this is, this is the, the, most, the most truest, the most um, cliche, and the most profound thing I'm going to say all day. It all came down to the fact they did not trust God. And so they did not move into the, I should say, the first generation of Israel did not move into the full destiny purposes of their promised land living because on this side of the river, they refused to give up their offense, their complaining, and their grumbling. Uh, Philippians 2, verse 14 through 16, talks about how do, it says, do all things. Someone say all things. All the things that you're called to do, do all things without grumbling or disputing. Now, do you know what happens next? It says, so that you will prove yourselves blameless and innocent, children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights, holding fast the word of life. Let's, uh, let's grab just one word out of that. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. Grumbling. To mutter. To murmur. Wait, it gets better. 
a secret debate, a secret displeasure not openly avowed, the secret grumblings that buzz away until heard. I need to create a culture in my heart that allows none of that to occur. And the Apostle Paul, centuries on centuries after the Israel didn't get into the promised land because of their own complaining and their own offense, he's saying, hey, do everything. And here's, here's the one mark, the one mark that sets a child of light apart from a child of darkness is grumbling and disputing. Okay. We're doing good, Sean. We're doing good. All right. I'm going to land the plane, and I'm going to say some more things in the 11 o'clock. Okay. If I want to create a counterculture in my own personal life, if I want to create a counterculture in my family, if we want to create, as, a, as Journey Church, if we want to create a counterculture against the spirit of offense that frankly, I actually, is one of the main reasons we haven't seen the type of breakthrough we've been asking for for the last decade, then we're going to, we're going to need to engage our own culture. Personally, corporately. Someone say engage. It's one of my four favorite words with regards to ministry, engage. All right, and so there are four ways to engage any culture. And this is personally, this is corporately, this is nationally, whatever. There are four ways to engage culture. The one that the church um, has typically relied on is postvention. So we're going to, we're after, after the stuff has hit the fan, after everything has happened, um, that's where we're going to kind of step in. If you're taking notes, and my gosh, I really hope that you are. Um, um, go with me on this, okay? Postvention. All right, so let's say offense has happened. Let's say the root of bitterness took root. Let's say that um, I've been walking in unforgiveness and I, I just, I, I've been in a season of this stuff. Postvention is I'm, I'm, I'm receiving counsel, I'm receiving a word like this, and, and now I'm going to begin to do some hard work. Number one, come to Jesus. Number two, come to the cross. If you can do one and two at the same time, awesome. Number three, do the hard work with Holy Spirit of uprooting the bitterness Forgive who you need to forgive and clean up your mess with those that you've defiled. Well, I didn't defile anybody. Yes, you, at some point you did. Offense doesn't stay quiet very long. It, it just doesn't. It, it doesn't it, it's, it, at some point, what is, what is defiling the inner person eventually bubbles up to the outside. It just doesn't stay quiet very long. All right. <laughs> I'll promise I'll get back to the good news at the end. All right. Yeah, if I remain in offense, it's because I forgot the work of the cross. If I remain in offense, it's because I've forgotten the work of the cross. I've got to get back to the cross. Um, number two, that place um, goes along with this. It's also the place where you die to yourself. Guys, uh, long before I had language for any of this, the number one thing I would do um, any time uh, that I would begin to entertain a uh, longer than a day or longer than a week of offense, is I would start asking um, Holy Spirit, okay, where do I need to die? No, where's the, where's the place of my death? It says, um, the, the part of um, uh, Galatians 5 that we all love, it's like the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, good, kindness, faithfulness, gentle, self-control. Like we love that part, and then like right after it says this, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. <laughs> Can we go back to the fruity part? I liked the fruity. I, I just like it when he speaks tooty fruity to me. No, I, I, I have to, I have to cul cultivate a lifestyle. Uh, our apostle's saying this all the time. He's always talking about how the Paul, Paul said, I die daily. I'm constantly in a place of, okay, Lord, this is pinging my heart. Where, where am I being invited to die to myself? Did you know that dead people don't get offended? Okay, good. We're, we're good with that one. I love it. All right. Here's the thing about postvention, though. Um, postvention is the least effective in changing culture. It cleans up the mess, but it's the least effective in actually changing culture. For changing culture, I need to look to the other three. I know that, I know that looks like it would or Sorry about that. We got inter. I'm doing this fast because I know I got to fly. Okay, we've got intervention. Someone say intervention. 
We've got prevention. Somebody say prevention. And invention. Someone say invention. That's my favorite. Okay, and, and just to give you a quick spoiler alert. The two that Jesus majored on mo- most when he, was, um, when he was engaging culture were invention and intervention. He was always disrupting the current culture and building the next one. Okay? So we're, we're, we're dancing in good footsteps when we do that. All right. Intervention. All right? The um, Proverbs 17, 14, I'm going to get this wording slightly off. I'm so sorry. Um, but it says that the beginning of strife is like the letting out water. So stop a quarrel before it begins. So intervention is at the point where offense begins to become a thing, um, where it begins to get talked about, where, where, where we start to ride the line between, um, between verbally processing and gossip. Um, that's, what, that's the place where intervention comes into play, and this is what we, what we need on that. First of all, catch yourself. Someone say, catch yourself. Someone say, check yourself. All right? So we want, um, in those moments, we want to we have a culture that shuts it down. We want to become immediately repentant, and we want to go to our brother or sister and, and, and wrangle the thing out, work it out. Someone say, work it out. All right? Now, if it's not yours, but the, uh, but the offense is with somebody else, hit the pause button. Okay? Most of us are not really good at this because we're so... Hmm. Sometimes we replace kind with nice. And in our desire to be nice, we listen to more venting than we need to. And so what we actually have to do is say, whoop, I'm just going to hit the pause button for a second. Did you talk to so-and-so? Like the so-and-so that you're like, did you talk to that person? And you got, and, and you, someone say, just put your finger out like this. Okay, imagine that you have an old school Nintendo in front of you um, and just hit the pause button. Okay, just learn how to hit that pause button and ask, have you confronted that person? And here's the thing, if they feel unsafe going to that person, offer to go with them. Okay. All right. Now, a couple caveats here. It is not on you. Someone say it's not on me. If you go to that person, it is not on you if they do not choose to take care of their side of the conflict. That's not on you. Don't own more of a conflict than you're supposed to own. It's simply on you to give the ministry of reconciliation its day in the sun. Okay. There's more, but I want to keep rolling. Prevention. Someone say prevention. Now, in these, these last two, um, the notes that I've got on this, would, they, they might actually overlap. So just kind of maybe jumble them together if you're writing stuff down or in, in your notepads. Proverbs 4.23 says this. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring or flow the issues of life. Oh, man. God. Okay. Um, what you take in through your eyes and what you take in through your ears have direct access to the condition of your heart. So when Solomon was writing, keep your heart, that word means, it means keep, it means observe, it means guard, it means watch over. Meaning, be diligent. You actually, you actually want to, oh, God, like, so I'm sorry, like, scriptures are like flying in my brain like now. I got it. Ah. Okay. You want to cultivate a life with Holy Spirit in such a way that it's his very peace, the peace of his nature, it says that guards your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. You do that by inviting him into the situation. Now, mind you, when, he, when you invite him into the situation, he might talk to you. Like, no, not like, not like, hey, let's have a chat. It's like, I'm going to talk to you. And, and learn to be okay with that. It's his love to actually bring us discipline. All right, so I need to learn how to keep, observe, guard, and watch over this thing right here. Because as soon as the things that happen in life happen to me, they have direct infiltration to my heart unless I've created a culture in which I guard what gets in and I keep out what what should be kept out. All right, heart monitor. I've preached on this before, so I'm just going to say it again. I need to learn to ask myself this question. Why do I feel this way? Why do I feel this way? Now, dudes in the room that you were taught across your life, men don't feel. You don't feel? What's this feel? No, no, no. Okay? I, I, need, I, need you to, like, I need you to begin to slice off those lies because you and I as men actually learn, we have to learn to show up to our emotion. 
we actually have to learn to actually like look at what I'm feeling, why I'm feeling it in the moment and ask, Holy Spirit, like I got nothing. Like I'm asking myself right now and I don't know why I feel the way that I feel right now. And I'm gonna need you to intervene. I'm gonna need you to say something because I'm not living in this condition one minute longer than I have to. And so guys, you gotta, you gotta learn to step in and say, okay, why do I feel this way? And I'm telling you right now, the journey that he will take you on, I've had so many experiences in this house, out of this house, in social sessions, in counseling sessions, in all kinds of, in all manner of things where the Lord has taken me on these trips and it's brought me to such new places of wholeness. I'm not bragging, I'm testifying. Do do you understand the difference? I'm not like, I'm saying that because, like, listen, and (laughs) I spent most of my life entirely guarded. I spent most of my life entirely guarded. And so like for this has been a journey for me. So I'm just testifying to the goodness of God that if you show up to your pain, if you show up and you don't vent sideways, but you vent up and you say, Jesus, I just like, I don't know what to do with this. All I know is this is how it feels. And now listen, feelings may be real, but they're, they're not always true. And that, guys, that's the truth intention because you got to show up to feelings that are real, find out what's actually true, and move forward. All right. Cease practicing the subtle art of assumption. Okay? When the enemy comes in and begins to say, this is why they did that. This is why they did that. This is why they did that. They're just being nasty. Like, they really don't, they're really not for you. Like, all, you know all the things? Guys, I'm talking to myself. I'm not just talking to us. I'm talking to myself. These are, those are things, those are devices of the enemy meant to throw you off track and to disconnect you from the people you're supposed to reconcile with. All right. Begin practicing kingdom optimism. If I choose to believe the best about someone, the most that will arise in my heart is confusion and it's remedied by simply asking the person what's up. All right. There's more. I'll probably go into that particular one in the second service. For right now, I want to get to invention. Some will say Invention. This is my favorite. This is the crux of the counterculture, friends, right here. Someone say brave. Someone say assertive. Someone say communication. Someone say direct. Someone say confrontation. This is the invention. If you and I are going to live as kingdom-minded believers in a kingdom reality, it means we've got to get really good at brave and direct communication. We've got to get really good at direct confrontation. No, it does not mean you go hissing and spitting up to the person that hurts you. It does mean that you remember that we have the ministry of reconciliation. This was what was gifted to us in Jesus. So if you've got to get your heart right, take all of five minutes to go, get, go to the cross. <laughs> Be reminded that the person who should carry the most of it, aren't you glad? There are 8.3 billion people on the planet right now. All of them started out sinners. Did you know that? All of them started out sinners, and Jesus could be offended with all of us. He could be offended with all of us, and it's one trip to the cross that I've got to take to remind myself, you went through far more than I did. Right. You have far more reason to be offended. And if you can hang there, then I can learn to hang there with you. It says in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. I can learn to hang there with him. While he's taking, not not the brutal, uh, yes, it was physically brutal what he went through, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to put a heavenly wager that says it was far more brutal. It says, Father, if you could take this cup from me, what was it? It was the cup of wrath over sin for all of human history. I think that beating was a little harder. And if he can hang there and do that, I can get up there with him. And I can die to that Achilles heel. I can die to that place that I haven't died to yet. And I can learn to be brave and assertive in my communication. I can choose to confront directly with the ministry of reconciliation on my lips and in my heart. Another piece, if I'm going to generate an unoffendable culture in my heart, I need to cultivate kingdom or honor lenses for others and their journey. Guys, this is going to be a mind blow to somebody in the room. You're never 100% in the right. There's not a single one of us that's ever been in a conflict that was 100% in the right. I'm not sure, I'm not sure if it's ever happened in the, in the history of the world with the exception of Jesus. 
So it means I need to go find out how does heaven see this person. Okay, I'm almost done, I promise. Healthy boundaries. I want to invite you to go to b-revealed.com. Earlier in the year, uh, right, at the, right at the outset of the year, um, Dave was on a thread of how to build your team. One of the reasons you and I get offended, oh, please hear me deep. Are you ready, please? Are you all good? You, I just, okay. One of the reasons that we get offended is oftentimes we allow people to have access to our heart that shouldn't have it, and then we keep out the people that should have access. And, and we, we get it twisted. You know what I mean? Like we just, we end up, we end up receiving counsel. We end up receiving uh, input and leaven, influence from people that should not have access to my heart. And they end up bringing toxicity into that place. What you do in that circumstance is you begin to learn healthy boundaries. There are some people that can get utter access to your heart and handle, handle themselves and manage things in a way that's going to protect your heart. But, um, Dave puts it this way in, in the prophetic word. He says, um, these, these should be the people who have purely kingdom, heaven's agenda for your life. And so I've got to let those people show up to the inner places of my heart. And the people that can't handle that level of connection, I move them to another place. It doesn't mean I stop loving. It just simply means I'm going to love you more appropriately at this place because you can't currently handle this level of connection. Okay. Lastly, please don't hear me say, stuff your pain. Please don't hear me say that. This is the other side of this tension. Please don't hear me say, stuff your pain. I know Bonnie's going to be with me on that. All right. The antidote to growing a root of bitterness is direct confrontation. Even after that, if you're still in pain and you vented to the Lord and you're still not feeling internally restored, bring godly counsel into your journey. Here's the caveat on this. This should be someone who is going to route you toward godly character, toward life in the spirit, not someone who is simply going to validate your feelings and resurrect your offense. Come on. Are you okay? Come on, that's good. Guys, your destiny is at stake. And I might talk about this in the 11 if, if I end up getting enough time, and I'm just going to drop this right here. Not only is your destiny at stake, but the generations after you are at stake. Yeah. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, you are the Holy Sifter. So I'm just asking you right now to sift out anything in the atmosphere remaining. Um, uh, let anything worldly or carnal just fall right to the ground. And I ask you, Holy Spirit, uplift the words um, that are to remain and that are going to remain in, in just a place of invitation for our hearts this morning to be able to receive and say, you know what, that's for me. I'm going to walk that way. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen.